Hello, I'm Jerry Baker. Welcome to The Big Interview. I'm joined today by Mark Mobius, Executive Chairman of the Templeton Emerging Markets Group. Thank you very much for joining us, Mark. Um, let's start, if we may, as we look at the picture for emerging markets. A uh, lot going on around the world, uh, especially for those in that particular sector. Let's start with a very topical area, which is Nigeria. Nigeria has been a very successful economic, had a very successful economic story in the last few years. Obviously, in the last uh, month or so, it's been dominated by this uh, this activity of this uh, Islamist group Boko Haram. Um, what do you see for Nigeria? Ha is is this something that's going to damage Nigeria's economic performance or investors' willingness to invest there? I don't think so. I think people are going to look through this and going to realize that this is probably, it's an unfortunate incident, of course, and we feel very sorry for the girls, but it's a, it's a, it's a good thing that, that we are now seeing some of the wrinkles and problems that Nigeria has, and it's becoming a global issue. So there's tremendous pressure on the Nigerian government to put their act together. And of course, the first question that has to be asked is where is the $20 billion missing from the National Oil Company? Mm. I mean, these are the kinds of issues that are now going to be coming to the fore, and I believe they're going to put a lot of, uh, uh, cause a lot of changes in the body politic. So uh, I see it as a positive development, and I do believe that eventually uh, these girls will be found. You don't think that it raises investors' concerns about the quality of governance in Nigeria? It's not been a very impressive performance, to be perfectly honest with you, by the government. Uh, of good luck, Jonathan, uh, in terms of dealing with this threat. Is that, does that not worry investors? Is that not something that will weigh on them? Well, as far as we're concerned, we knew this was the case. We knew that there were a lot of problems in government. The corporate governance is a problem in companies as well. Uh, but there are also bright spots. And a bright spot, for example, is the central bank. Under Zanussi, they did a terrific job in cleaning up the banking system. So uh, there's positives and negatives. But now, in the age of the internet, the age of cell phones, smartphones that everybody now has, the information is getting out, and the pressure on the government to change is there, and I believe you're going to see a lot of changes. Let's move on around the world to another hotspot, uh, <coughs> Ukraine, uh, and Russia, actually, in particular. Russia's had a pretty weak economic performance uh, over the last year or so, a lot of turbulence, now facing uh, the growing um, uh, impact of sanctions. Um, and we're seeing the economy weakening still further. How do you see this playing out um, in terms of the political implications, but, but most importantly in terms of the economic prospects for, for Russia in particular? Well, if you look at Ukraine, there's no question in my mind that they will come to some agreement. And it's really about the Europeans and the Russians. The Americans, of course, are deeply involved, but in terms of the accommodation and the negotiations, it has to be between the Russians and the Europeans. And they will come to some accommodation whereby uh, Ukraine becomes a uh, republic with uh, individual areas with a lot of autonomy. Uh, in terms of what's happening in Russia, it is true the economic growth rate has come down. The ruble has come down substantially. But individual companies are doing very well. Mm. Especially in the energy sector. Exactly. Okay. Energy and mining mm. and some other sectors now are looking very, very cheap. So we are in there looking very, very carefully and actually buying some of the Russian stocks. And you don't think as the world <coughs> tries to deal with the Russia challenge and <coughs> looks for alternative sources of energy, particularly for Western Europe, which is heavily dependent on, on Russian energy, you don't think that's going to weaken the prospects for Russian ener energy companies in the medium term? No, because they've got China. Right. And as you know, Putin's going to be in China soon and will be negotiating that gas agreement. Of course, it's going to take a few years for the pipeline to be built. But there's enough demand in China to take a mini slot, slack that would happen in, in Europe. Let's move on to another of the, what we used to refer to as BRICS. People don't use that phrase quite so often these days, but Brazil. Uh, again, another country that's had a lot of, faced a lot of turbulence in the last year. It's going to be hosting the World Cup in the next few weeks, and a lot of attention of the world's going to be on it, hoping for a bit of a, an economic boost from there. But do you think the policies that this government's been pursuing, um, you know, the, the concerns that there are, they've been about inflation and about what's been going on in Brazil, that, that Brazil is actually going to be able to, to meet the potential that people were expecting for it for some time? Not under this government, mm. and I believe there's going to be a change mm. in the government, unless the government makes a real about face, which will be very difficult. And I think if you look at the popularity ratings, Rousseff is way down. Mm. And there's a good chance she will lose the next election. Uh, 
in that case, and one of the reasons, by the way, there's been a recovery in the market is that people are looking forward to the day when she's not there and policy changes towards more business-friendly environment. Mm. Let's look at the broader picture for the global economy. Last year, when the Federal Reserve um, started first really seriously talking about tapering, about withdrawing, um, about scaling back its asset purchases, caused tremendous dislocation in the world, particularly for a lot of those emerging market currencies we saw, um, you know, uh, Turkey, uh, Brazil, South Africa, the Fragile Five people talk about. Now the Fed's embarked on the tapering process. There's still a lot of uncertainty about how the Fed will, uh, how the Fed will move once it's done the uh, tapering process. And there's also a lot of uncertainty seems to be in fixed income markets generally with, the, with, with bond yields, you know, once again uh, hitting lows for the year. How are emerging markets going to deal with this continuing, uh, with this, with the importance of the, the the Fed and what it's doing, with this continuing effect on 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 the rest of on capital flows around the west of the rest of the world? Well, I think you've got to realize what happened is that when you had uh, this tremendous flow of money going into the banks in America, and not only in America, by the way, in China, in the Europe, in Japan, and so forth, the central banks have been engulaging their balance sheets tremendously, and money has been flowing into these banks. The problem has been the banks are not utilizing that for loans. Loan to deposit ratios mm. are going down in all these countries, in China, in the US, in Japan, in Europe. And the velocity of money is going down. So we have this incredible pile of liquidity that's waiting to be invested. And it will be invested mm. eventually mm. because the banks are now getting their house in order. The balance sheets are looking a lot better. Right. So we expect a big, big flow back into emerging markets and developed markets, by the way. And of course, the U.S. market has done very well, but it's going to do a lot better. And you expect that, that flow into forward. equities and fixed income? Is that just, yeah. Yeah, that's the other story, mm. because what happened is that over these years, we've seen three things. One, of course, economic growth in emerging markets up triple or double at least, then mm. developed. Debt to GDP levels low. And the... Uh, the pile of foreign exchange reserves growing every day and surpassing that of the developed countries. Mm. So the rating agencies have been upgrading the emerging market countries. All these bond traders and bond investors went into the emerging markets in, by the way, in a lot of local currency bonds, and then the tapering talk started, mm. Mm. and everybody panicked, and they moved out. This is just temporary because, as you said, with interest rates in America continuing on down, mm. the spread between emerging markets debt and U.S. Treasuries is very wide mm. and very tempting for investors. So you're going to see a flow back into these bond markets. Even with the currency risk, you don't think people are worried about the currency risk in some of these countries? Well, you've you've seen, seen in the last year. Well, they learned that currency can be an incredible uh, benefit. They can make a lot of profits, not only on the interest rate spread, but also on the currency. because. If you know, if you look back, uh, what happened to the Brazilian real and many other currencies, it got very, very strong, got too strong, of course, and then now it's come down again, and they're going to see opportunities in currency as well. Two other very quick, uh, uh, but very important, very large countries. India, first of all, you've just seen this uh, new government elected with a huge uh, mandate, apparently, for change. Do you expect a lot to change in India under the new Prime Minister Modi? There are going to be tremendous changes, but unfortunately, he doesn't have control of the upper house. So in order to make uh, legal changes, it will be difficult, but administrative changes he definitely will make, and we're going to see a lot of action in that direction. But I don't think we can uh, put our hopes up too high. Mm. You know, you can't expect uh, this to happen overnight. You've got mm. a very entrenched bureaucracy that is going to resist him at every turn. And finally, most important, I suppose, of all, certainly in terms of emerging markets, China. Um, government there seems to be embarked on some significant reforms Growth does seem to be slowing. Maybe the composition of growth is slowing. How do you see China in the next uh, in the next couple of years? Well, what I like to point out to people is that okay, 10% growth in 2000, you added maybe 800 billion to the economy. 7% growth now is adding 900 billion. So the base has gotten so much bigger. Mm -hmm. So don't think of China as going down or shrinking. It's expanding. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is expect a lot of bad news. Why? Because of the reform program. If the Chinese government is saying, look, you state-owned enterprises have to be on your own, we're not going to control prices anymore, we're not going to give you support, you're going to have bankruptcies, you're going to have bond defaults. Mm. 
But as far as I'm concerned, it's great news because mm. it means these companies, will be, the survivors, will become a lot more profitable. And of course, it's our job to watch and make sure we pick the right ones. So you're pretty optimistic about China. I mean, equities have not performed well over a long time in China, but you think uh, as, the, as the economy uh, is reformed, as, as changes, then, then the prospects are going to get improved. Yeah, because what they're doing is moving the A shares, you know, the restricted shares, mm. into Hong Kong mm. and melding this into one big market. A, B, H, red chips, Hong Kong. This will be all one big market. And of course, in typical Chinese fashion, they're going to do it very slowly and carefully. But that's definitely on the cards. Mark Mobius, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, for the big interview. Thank you. Thank you.